Hello and welcome to the 2023 Kia EV6. I know, I'm sorry, we're doing another electric car. I promise we'll do some sports cars later on, okay? All right? So, Kia EV6, this is their all-electric platform. It's shared with the Hyundai Ioniq 5. This is the wind trim, which is essentially the base trim, but it has all-wheel drive, uh, giving it a 0 to 60 time of 5.1 seconds, a range of 282 miles, and an as-tested price of $56,000. Now, we're gonna take a look at two things. How competitive is the EV6 in the realm of you know, compact crossovers, compact electric crossovers, but more importantly, Kia thinks this is the successor to the Stinger, which we absolutely adore here at Clutch Kick. So, is it? The exterior i like the more traditional looking headlamps they didn't try to do anything too controversial or too crazy if you want something a little bit different hyundai ionic 5 might be the move for you the tiger grill i think kia calls it is pretty iconic it's kind of the look that they are going for right now i quite like that the front is pretty traditional for the most part which is which is good the back is a little bit a little bit more controversial um, we'll take a look at that later the mirrors are quite interesting they kind of jut out a little bit they have lots of different aerodynamic styling tweaks. I kind of like the little ribbing right here on the uh, on the fender there. Keeps it kind of interesting. The, th the thing that we really enjoy though is that in the D-pillar right here, there's this little light that projects at night and it's quite great when you unlock the car and it just illuminates the D-pillar kind of like an art exhibit or something like that. Go around to the back here. The taillight is this thin line, which is a very popular design trend right now. I have mixed thoughts on it. I don't mind it. Um, and so that's good. The reverse light is down here. It's like an F1 style rear, rear lights, but just for the reverse light. Um, I have noticed though that it doesn't illuminate very well from an exterior perspective. And actually the owner of the car noted the same thing. She, she realized that because it's so low down, it's kind of aimed downwards. People have a hard time seeing it when they're out and about or if they're driving their high SUV. So some people don't know that the car is in reverse, which could potentially be dangerous. Uh, the car has a very fast back swooping uh, type of look. It's, it's the uh, coupe SUV thing that everyone loves so much, right? The BMW X4, XX, Cayenne Coupe, GLE Coupe, whatnot. It's the trend that everyone loves. Uh, right now, but thankfully in the EV6 doesn't um, mess too much with the rear cargo room and more importantly It doesn't mess with rear headroom So even though it has this modern design feature that I don't like it doesn't have as many of the compromises as some of the other competitors have with this similar design um, but yeah, overall the styling, uh, very handsome. You'll notice that the wheels are very close to the outboards of the ends of the car. Uh, compared to the rest of the segments, um, not just for EVs, but for similar sized cars, we're talking BMW X4, we're talking the uh, Tesla Model Y. It actually has a slightly shorter length overall, but a uh, longer wheelbase. So you're gonna actually get really great room uh, inside the car, which we'll take a look later on. So starting with the driving experience of the EV6, it's a little bit different than other EVs that I've, I've experienced, mostly because I've driven a lot of Teslas. Uh, we tried the Polestar last year and those were very sport oriented, right? They're really capitalizing on the fact that the electric motor provides you that instantaneous torque. Um, it's gonna really help with that sporty, you know, nimble driving experience, right? The EV6 is a different approach and I like that. What do I mean by that? The whole car feels more on the softer side. Nothing about this driving experience makes me want to hammer down some turns very aggressively trying to kiss the apex just so. Nothing about this car feels 
like it wants to do that. I mean, it can handle corners very competently. I wouldn't say it flops about or anything, but there's definitely some softness to the suspension. It's extremely compliant on the freeway. It absorbs bumps beautifully. Um, through turns, there's you know a little bit more body roll than you expect. And if you put it in sport mode, uh, it doesn't really make the steering excessively heavy or anything like that. It, honestly, it feels like it really just messes with the throttle response. The overall sensation of the car is definitely a more luxurious type of feel rather than a, a sporty feel, which I think suits this car just fine. And, you know, if you want the sportier version of this car, there is the GT trim. I don't know if the GT line is going to offer a better handling. I know the GT line has very similar performance to this car because mechanically they are identical to this wind model. Um, but the GT might have different suspension upgrades that makes it, you know, feel a little bit more aggressive. But, you know, like I said, this is the wind all-wheel drive, which is essentially the least expensive all-wheel drive model that you can get for the EV6. And it just, it does what it's intended to do, which is a more luxurious, more comfortable, more relaxed driving style. And that's really neat because that's a... Uh, side of the electric motor that a lot of people don't capitalize on, right? A lot of people use electric motor for uh, sporty driving because it has that instantaneous torque. Well, an electric motor is also really quiet, right? You think about how BMW, Lexus, Mercedes, they spend so much money trying to make their cars as quiet as possible. And now with the electric motor, that just makes that job so much easier. And so using an electric motor to really sell the whole package of quiet, of luxury, of space, of comfort, I think that's a really neat approach and the EV6 does a brilliant job of that. Diving into the driving dynamics a little bit more, the steering is on the light side. Again, a little bit more luxurious feeling than some of the sporty competitors in this segment, right? Um, but I really appreciate that there's little to no dead spot on center, so it makes the steering rack feel reasonably responsive, even though it's a little bit slower of a ratio. So you're gonna find that you're gonna be turning the steering wheel a little bit more to you know, get some of those same turns. Uh, the regenerative braking is very interesting. We will touch on it very briefly right now. A couple things to note about the regenerative braking. You change the levels with the paddle shifters here. That's right, this EV has paddle shifters, just like a lot of uh, Hyundai Kia products. And what it allows you to do is to, on the fly, change the amount of regenerative braking you have. You can have the max level, which is three, all the way down to zero, which is literally no regenerative braking whatsoever, which is kind of interesting. Not a lot of EVs do that. And in the lower regen settings, when you lift off on the throttle, even though the car is slowing down, it actually won't throw on the brake lights, which is good, because then that won't cause people to panic behind you. And only in the upper two regenerative modes where it's slowing the, down the car a little bit more aggressively, that's when it's going to turn on the brake lights when you lift off on the throttle. Now, on top of these three adjustments right here, um, there's also an automatic regen. And from what I've seen and what I've observed, it seems like the automatic regen, what it does is basically it kind of adjusts the intensity of the regen based on the speed that you're driving, based on the conditions that you're driving. Within the automatic regen mode, there's three settings, I guess, of sensitivity of that automatic regen, I guess, how quickly it changes between those regenerative profiles. Um, and that's just on the uh, dash right here. I adjust that with the paddles. Once I'm in the automatic regen mode, from there you can adjust the intensity or sensitivity of the automatic regen. But then we found later last night that within the infotainment screen, there's an additional three settings on top of the original three settings for the automatic. So there's a lot of choices going on here. And we'll touch on that a little bit later on in the video. So bear with me on that. But here we are on the freeway. We're approaching freeway speeds here. And the thing I just absolutely love about this interior and how it drives down the road is not how it feels in terms of the driving dynamics. It's actually going to be how quiet this interior is. I absolutely love it. Um, NBH is extremely well controlled. There's no buzzing in the interior. The road noise is very, very well managed. There's almost no tire noise coming through. Uh, there's almost no wind noise. The front windows here are actually double panes, uh, which is part of why the car is so quiet in here absolute top marks on refinement for an EV. Just, you know, one of the problems we've talked about in the past with uh, Tesla is even though there's no engine noise coming through, they forgot that because there's no engine noise drowning out the other noises in the car, everything else is amplified, so to speak, right? So when you're driving a Tesla, often you'll find that there's gonna be some creaking, some squeaking, some wind noise, tire noise. Um, that car needs a little bit more insulation, whereas this, oh my goodness, this absolutely nails the luxury comfort aspect of it. And it's a Kia. This isn't the Genesis version of the car, right? This isn't the GV70 or even the Hyundai Ionic 5. This is the Kia uh, version, which is essentially the, the base version of this platform, so to speak. 
uh, and this is the almost base trim, but yet it is extremely comfortable, extremely quiet. The interior is very spacious. We have excellent room. Uh, last night when we were testing this car hard, we had uh, four people in this car, uh, two of which are quite a bit taller than me, and we all fit in the car perfectly, and no one's knees were touching the, the front seats. It was incredible room. Um, Kia has done a really good job of building this platform around the advantages of the electric vehicle, right? This platform is designed to be EV from day one. It wasn't retrofitted from a gas platform or anything like that. And what they did was, even though the length of this car is a little bit shorter than comparable cars in the segment like the BMW X3 or the Tesla Model Y, it actually has a longer wheelbase, so you have fantastic legroom inside. That said, compared to cars like um, the Model Y with its glass roof, or compared to cars like the BMW X3 or X4, a little bit less headroom, even though this um, has great headroom uh, for the EV6 because this model doesn't have the uh, glass roof or the sunroof or whatnot. Um, it has a little bit less headroom than the competition because being an EV, it, it, the whole seat sits a little bit higher up because of the battery being the floor, right? So the floor is a little bit thicker, kind of raises everything up. Um, with that though, something that I've noticed in a lot of Teslas is because of that battery floor, you have to sit kind of low down and then because of that, your your, your feet kind of sit higher up. So it kind of feels like you're having your legs elevated, which is a weird sensation. Don't get that much uh, in this car. Um, the comfort and the ergonomics of this car are really good. The seats are very comfortable. We did a lot of miles in this car last night. For this next part, I wanna talk about things that we learned while we were driving this car. And these are things that we thought were really important to cover because they're things that you can't read about in Kia's brochure. I want to kind of talk a little bit now about the actual livability, the usability of the interior and the driving experience from that perspective. And from there, that's kind of where some things were a little bit surprising to us. Um, Andrew, who edits our videos, is, is very passionate about the EV6. In fact, he, he had this plan of once his uh, Kona Electric's lease ran out, he was thinking about trading it in for an EV6. But after spending some time with the car, there are some things that kind of come to mind which may have given him some second thoughts. And I kind of feel the same way, and actually Stefan later on will probably touch on some uh, things as well. The first thing that we all notice is whenever we get the steering wheel exactly where we want it to, you know, based on our height, based on where the seat is set, the speedometer is hidden behind the steering wheel. It's, it's kind of far to the left, and so it's kind of at the uh, 10 o'clock position on the steering wheel, uh, which makes it difficult to see. And it's not just us. I've read several reviewers that have also had the same thoughts. The owner of this car, she also has the same thoughts. She told me that Lewis, one of the most annoying things about the speedometer is that it's not in the center. And not only is it towards the left, it's so far left it's often covered by the steering wheel. And I totally see what she's talking about. I, it's it, it's kind of weird. On top of that though, there's something about the gauge cluster that just doesn't sit right with me. And this is another complaint that we've had amongst you know several people that driven the car in the past uh, few hours is that there's a lot of information on here that isn't immediately relevant to your to your driving and just the layout of it doesn't prioritize important information. Let me give you an example. The speedometer like I said is way too far to the left and towards the right of it is this bar that kind of shows the speed. It's not an RPM meter, right? It's an electric car. It's not a power bar. It's just this bar that goes up progressively with the speedometer. And I don't know why that needs to be there because at a glance, that bar doesn't tell me how fast the car is. I still need to know what the actual speed is. So why is that taking up space on a majority of the left side of the screen? On top of that, the right side is filled with the range information. Um, that's fair enough, right? There's a power bar showing when I'm on the on the throttle. And then when I lift off, it kind of shows the regen amount. It's the same color for the normal mode. So that might be confusing. Um, but the center bit is where you actually do the configuration. And there's not a lot of choices there. I think you can you, you, you look at some trip information. Um, there's some navigation information if you're using the navigation function of the infotainment system, not if you're using CarPlay. Um, there's a little bit of uh, adaptive lane keep information, the auto cruise control information, but a majority of the screen cannot be customized. You can cycle through the modes and they'll change how the graphics looks, but you can't really change the positioning of things. The only thing that you can change is the information in the center, I wanna say third of that screen. And that's kind of a missed opportunity given that the gauge cluster is a really beautiful high resolution display. Um, I, I feel like little tweaks here will make that screen a lot more useful than it already is. Furthermore, not only are the 
customization is fairly limited, you can't put your music information in there, which a lot of cars used to be able to, but we found that some of the cars that we've been testing in recent years stopped putting music information there. I assume maybe it's because you can see it on the wide infotainment screen, but even then, you know, that'd be a great choice to have. I mean, this car, you'll find as we go throughout the video and as we talk about a little bit more about the user experience of this car, this car has a lot of options and yet it's missing some critical options as well. Um, when we when you go into the sport mode here, it, it does the same thing that I was complaining about in the uh, in the normal mode, which was the speedometer is in a place that is kind of hard to see, that's often blocked by the steering wheel, and you have a speed bar, which is a relative percentage of top speed. I, I'm not quite sure what's going on here. On top of that, the efficiency bar at the bottom middle of the display uh, in normal and eco mode, that disappears for a torque bar. Now you think, well, that's kind of that's kind of interesting for a uh, for the sport mode, right? That's relevant. Well, except it's directly proportional to the uh, power meter on the right, which shows you how aggressively you are getting on the throttle. So it's redundant in that regards. So it it I mean it looks good, right? The colors are pretty well selected. The font is really good, but it doesn't actually help me drive better. It doesn't give me more information, and so that's that's a bit of a miss. Now with that said. That's a brilliant thing about these modern cars with these displays and that they all run on software. So if Kia decided that, hey, you know, we got enough customer feedback that this that this layout isn't beneficial to many people, they can actually change it and they can actually make it better over time. Only time will tell uh, if that will be the case. But today, here in 2023, this is kind of what we're, de kind of what we're dealing with with the gauge cluster. Going to the comfort level of the car, right? We're talking about how good of a car this is for daily driving. I have to give Kia a, a, a huge compliment on its driver assistance features. Now, it has a lane keep assist, right? So there's a mode of the lane keep where it will warn you if you're crossing the line, it will edge you back. Um, but there's a separate mode which is designed for it to actually send you in lane. It's not a pogoing system. It can be in that other mode, but there is a mode where it, it fully activates and it is actively keeping you in the lane. Now, Kia and Hyundai don't advertise this at all as a autopilot competitor or a, what's it called, Ford Blue Cruise competitor or the Calic one, which is called the Super Cruise or whatnot. They don't advertise it like that, right? They advertise it as an assistant feature and I absolutely love them for that, right? They're not overselling this feature. And what I love about their assistant feature here is it's very smooth. Uh, for the most part here. It's following the car in front of me in a very smooth way. It's not panicking when the car stops in front. It's being very gradual with all its acceleration and deceleration. Um, but most importantly, the thing that I was very impressed with was the lane keep. It actually does a very competent job of keeping the car in the lane. Even if the curve is a little bit more aggressive, it's pretty good at doing that as well. And again, this is what happens when you don't oversell a feature, when you don't overpromise something, right? They didn't try to say that this is gonna drive down the freeway for you. You know, this, this could get down most freeways actually pretty comfortably by itself. It can't change lanes for you like the Tesla system or some of the other cars, um, but it does a very smooth job of keeping you center in the lane, which sometimes doesn't even happen at Tesla. Sometimes it hugs too far to the left, too far to the right. Um, I'm absolutely enjoying the assistant features on this car. Super impressed um, by that. So that's a huge up. If you're looking for a car that's you know, going to give those uh, comfort features when you're driving on long trips, uh, this is a very good option. This is a very good option. Now, speaking of driver assistant features, this has a camera system kind of similar to Honda's did back in the day where you turn on the turn signal and it would turn on a camera on that side. This actually has it on both sides. So if you turn on the left turn signal, it will turn on a camera on the left side. If you turn on the right one, it will turn on the camera on the right side and it will display that on the uh, instrument cluster here, which is incredibly useful considering that the blind spots are rather big in this car. The D pillar is quite big. In fact, I was lane changing earlier and I actually missed a car. It completely disappeared when I was looking. I couldn't see in the mirrors. The mirrors aren't particularly big either. And the blind spot system actually beeped at me and warned at me. Um, and so that was incredibly helpful. Lots of great camera systems on this car, which is again, very important because the visibility in this car is very challenged, not just from a uh, rear three quarter perspective, but also also out the back, the rear window is incredibly small. Um, it's so small that uh, there's not even a rear wiper, just to give you an idea. So the camera system, very, very good on this car. 
I will note though that the touch buttons in the center are extremely clear. It's actually a digital display, but it's, it only really displays things in black and white and orange for when things are on. Um, but it's very easy to see. However, it is kind of difficult to touch because the touch points are actually quite small. On top of that, the touch activation is on initial contact. So unlike some cars where you can touch it and then press harder and it vibrates to tell you that you've activated that switch, this changes as soon as you touch it. There isn't a second um, input step basically um, before things change. That can make it a little bit difficult for while you're driving and you're trying to activate something, you may accidentally touch something. Um, you can't feel for it because it's not textured at all. Um, there's no physical you know, little line for top of you guide to where certain buttons are. Uh, they can be a little bit challenging to use, so just be aware of that. Uh, beyond the buttons for the things mentioned, the gear shifter is a, is a rotating knob, um, which is actually quite intuitive to use. I quite like that. And and yeah, overall the usability of here is, is fine for a modern car. It's still not my favorite. I'm, I am going to continue to, to say, I think a physical knob for climate control and for volume is going to be uh, the way to go, a dedicated one at that. So on top of the various different auto regenerative settings, there's also an eye pedal mode, which will allow the car to come to a complete stop. So it's true one pedal driving. Um, and that's, that's a uh, feature that is not on every single EV actually. A lot of them, they'll have regenerative braking modes, which kind of slow down the car most of the way, but not go all the way down to zero miles an hour. So, so that's neat, lots of options potentially too many options. I'd be wary of that. The compliment I will give it though, is that the Polestar that we drove actually caused a couple of crew members to be sick and has nothing to do with the smoothness of the driver. I, I mean, I, I've driven Teslas for a long time and I drove the Polestar in the same way and I tried very hard to be smooth, but in that max regen setting on the Polestar, it is extremely aggressive. It has something to do with the calibration of how aggressively the car slows down based on how you lift off on the pedal. And apparently it was just really hard to be smooth in that vehicle. Um, again, we drove this car a lot yesterday and we didn't and we didn't find any type of um, issues with the regenerative braking on this car. It, they just calibrated this car really well. So not only did they manage the, the you know, NVH on this car very well, it's very quiet, but they also made the driving experience uh, really smooth as well. It's really easy to be smooth. So for this review, we're gonna do something a little bit different. And so that's why I have all of us in here because it's it's a three-man job covering the interior of this mm -hmm. car. So let's, let's start with um, the regen. Uh, I think that's the most important part. Yeah. The regen, like I talked about earlier, um, has a couple of adjustments where you can go from maximum regen to no regen whatsoever. There's also an automatic mode that will adjust the aggressiveness of the regen, I think. And then um, an eye pedal mode for one. And an eye pedal mode, yeah, for, for yeah, so you can come to a complete stop because mm -hmm. the other mode doesn't do that. Um, okay, uh, and then within the automatic mode, there's three sensitivities, but then recently we found that with, yeah, and so in here, see, Stefan hasn't even seen this yet. There's strong deceleration, medium deceleration, gentle deceleration, and that's different from the regenerative setting that's in here. I can start it. So if we go, there's the different intensities of the auto or something, and that's not to be confused with the full eye pedal, but that's separate from the adjustment of the auto mode here. So why? But anyways, let's go back to utility mode so I can kill the motor and then, you know, utility mode. What is utility mode? And Andrew knows this because he has a Kona electric. What is, what is yeah, this it, it, it turns on the HVAC. It turns on everything. Everything's powered by the high voltage system instead of your 12 volt battery. Ah, okay. So your radio, because even in an EV, when it's just in uh, accessory mode, okay. it's using, it's pulling from the 12 volt. So this pulls everything from the high voltage so pack. On a, a gas car equipment, this would be the on position, ignition on without firing the engine, basically. They implemented a mode here, presumably to be used while you're sitting and charging. Okay. It's called Sounds of Nature. <laughs> and we can jump right in with a moment of meditation. Oh, I need this after reviewing this car. Beautiful. Beautiful. All right. The experience of the universe was pretty great. Oh, this has a, a Hans Zimmer flavor to it. That's why you like it. <laughs> <laughs> Now, why we can't make the car sound like this when it's accelerating? We'll, oh, we'll, we'll talk, we'll talk about, about how that. we can make the car That's sound. That's a different setting. Yeah. So, <laughs> so by the way, yeah. So these aren't noises when acceleration. This is just this is essentially like built-in MP3 files. Yes. Almost, that and you can leave it running while you're driving too, if you want just something calming. I guess. I, yeah. 
So I want to note too, while we're here, uh, that Kia apparently does do software updates. They're supposed to do twice a year, the owner said. Um, she just installed the, their latest software update a couple weeks ago, and she noticed that nothing changed except there were additional V sounds, whatever these are. What, they, what was this whole section called? Uh, sounds of nature. Sounds of nature, yeah. There were additional sounds of nature for her to choose from. So that's that's what Kia is updating, which, it, which is fair enough. I'd rather that than come back and, you know, I go back to my brother's Tesla, and then every single control has changed once again. So, yeah. you know, give me more sounds of nature, I guess, with every <laughs> software update. Here we go, yeah. Active, active sound, sound design. design, yep. Okay. So there's a lot that you can do yeah, here. Yeah, you take over this um, section. You're very passionate about this. You can change the sensitivity. So like moderate change, largest change, smallest change. And basically that is how much the sound revs up as you accelerate, as you uh, depress the accelerator. Mm -hmm. um, there's a ton of customization that you can do here. Three primary sounds that uh, Kia provides, um, stylish, dynamic, and <laughs> cyber. <laughs> they all, <laughs> they're, they're all very, very similar. Um, I think we found that we settled on cyber as kind of the best of the three. No, I settled on everything off as the best. <laughs> everything of the off, that's right. That is Zero truly volume, the best. Yeah. But if you have to do one, yeah, yeah, yeah. cyber is the way to go. One, yeah. um, but inside of that, in addition to that customization, there's also a tremendous amount of customization here. Uh, master volume, acceleration, pedal response. Um, again, just the sounds and everything like that here. And you can see they've even provided uh, like an S curve for how... Uh, the sound how, comes on as you saw. <laughs> yeah, how responsive it's gonna be. Clearly someone was employed full time just to design this well, aspect of the vehicle. They yes. would have to. You know, you look at that and you think, oh, that's the torque curve of the, uh, of the electric motor. No, it's not. <laughs> it's the sound curve of the acceleration sounds as you press it and depending on how aggressively you press it yeah it's Very confusing overly complicated that seems to be the yeah the the par for the course for a lot of these features they're just overly complicated there's just too much choice too many options and we like points. choice we like refinement but i i think that with with that stefan brought up a really good point which was if if a manufacturer has too many choices right um, that means that they are not intentional so we're trying out the various different backup cameras right here Leave it in reverse. Yeah, leave it in, yeah, so there's the top down view. And then, you know, Stefan, if you want, right, you can actually be, you know, I'm trying to really oh, show off the different modes. Yeah, see, he's like a sports commentator, right? You're choosing the uh, the different camera angles that you are, you are looking for. <laughs> and if I want to back up using that mode, I can do that, which I don't know how that, how that helps me back up, but that's okay, look at that. Oh yeah, oh yeah, very good, very good. Nice. So that that's kind of neat. I, I like the different features there. I feel like that's, again, too much. Like, as I'm driving it, this would be just too much to try and interact with. The top down is fine. Is there different angles? Of, oh, there are. Ah, very good. Nice. The, you know, the usability of the interface um, features and whatnot. Has CarPlay, ultra wide. The icons fill everything up brilliantly. That's awesome. In fact, I would be in here most of the time. Yeah. Right? Um, but the rest of the interior here, this is where it kind of gets interesting. I want to draw your attention to the uh, HVAC system here. And you may notice that there are no uh, temperature controls here. Well, that's because this is an adaptive HVAC system. And so what, how you change it is you press this button right here, and all of a sudden this becomes your HVAC panel. And you have knobs to adjust for your uh, HVAC controls right there. But if you want to adjust your volume, you can press that. And now this is this is now the volume control. And one thing interesting that we discovered is that four of the climate things stay on there regardless. The, of the important stuff stays right and here. If you tap any of those four, yeah, it'll quickly take you back to climate. Which is so great. that's pretty intuitive. Very I can appreciate that. Yes, yes, we didn't catch that last night. Um, Going along with the too much choice though, there's now three auto climate. There are, yeah. We noticed that there's three levels of auto climate. I thought auto was just auto but apparently that is that is incorrect it's, it's one of those things right it's not a deal breaker i want to make that clear right don't don't not buy this car because of this one thing right i don't want to get negative comments uh, on youtube i already had enough of that on the market gti people were very upset about what we said about that car but <laughs> but um it's just something to consider it's a little bit weird now again i prefer this over the ionic 5 right like because 
you know, you do actually get a knob. That knob does two jobs, but you know, I'll take what I can get nowadays, right? And if you want to get real technical, you have a volume toggle on the steering wheel, so you could just leave you that do. always on climate. Yep, you 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 could. That is uh, that is something to consider. Um, speaking of, just real quick note: the volume uh, music control stuff are on the right side of the steering wheel, which is a little bit different. And more importantly, the uh, seat track button—it's up to go back a song and it's down to go to the next song. Makes no sense. Uh, and this is not consistent within Kia Hyundai products. It's only on some of them. Like on his uh, Kona Electric, it's the correct way, which is up for the next song. On some Genesis products I've driven, it is up to go the, the song behind. I don't know what's going on here. All right, that's that. That's that. Um, but yeah, the climate control, three automatic settings, which we found adjust the fan speed apparently, which doesn't make sense because automatic means that you, it changes the fan speed for me. Just a little bit uh, too much choice going on here. Moving down here though, this is quite good. I want really want to showcase this, um, is we have the uh, controls, right? So the uh, controls that we were talking about for the uh, heated seats, the heated steering wheel, ventilated seats, they are physical because this is a lower trim level and they are physical on the highest trim level of the GT, but the middle trim level gets the capacitive touch buttons right here, which is interesting. And gloss black. And they're gloss black, yes. Oh, Everyone's no. favorite gloss black, yes, yes. No uh, so there's black. Yeah. So we would go base trim just for this. Yes, I would, or the highest trim. Yes, you you would justify it, right? It's just like, well, I'm, I'm gonna have to get the performance <laughs> level because that will give me the uh, physical buttons. Um, but the knob right here is pretty good. As we've been talking about, I've been thinking a lot about how most of the stuff that you would dig into with the touchscreen is mm. gonna be set it and forget it kind mm. of things. Okay. So That's it's kind of you know once you've got your regenerative braking figured out, you've got your sounds of nature figured out, yep. and you've got all your settings. I don't really see myself using this too regularly because as you noted, you've got a phone plugged in. Yeah. You're just gonna live in CarPlay. Yeah, for Apple all CarPlay of this. or even Android Auto. Um, I, well, we talked about this in the driving section, but the 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 driving interface right here is, is doesn't make a lot of sense here. Um, we're not moving unfortunately, so it's harder to show, but miles per hour is right here. And then this bar fills up as the miles per hour increases. But the problem is there's no marking on this bar. So this bar doesn't, this is just tell me percentage of top speed is really what that bar graph tells me. And, and this bar more importantly is where I want the digital speed to be because this is right at, behind the steering wheel, uh, which you had a problem with. Yep. Andrew had a problem with. Every single reviewer that I watched a video of also had a problem with. So it's, it's not just me. It's not just how I drive. I know I have an insane driving position, but that is not in the correct place. Um, you have a power meter on this side right here that kind of shows, you know, if you're on the power, if you're doing the regen braking, so, you know, as you're stepping on it, accelerating will fill up here, and as you do the regen braking, it'll fill up down here. This is kind of your efficiency meter bar. That changes, though, if you go into the sport mode, you have this torque bar, which sounds really cool, but it's it's directly linked to this power bar right here. So this is just a redundancy. Too minimalist a display? Yeah. This is the opposite this direction. This is the opposite. This has got too much. N the Pulsar had a great gauge cluster though, because that was customizable where it, where it counted and mm -hmm. had really clear, uh, you know, speedometer and port information. Um, and then also the infotainment system, even though it didn't have CarPlay or Android Auto, it's because it was Android Auto, right? It had a version of Android running on it. Yep. Um, so that was pretty good. We just wish it had HVAC controls and we just wish it had a real interior. Um, but... <laughs> Uh, it, Speaking of physical controls, they yep. got plenty, I think. You got all yep. the four window switches. Four window switches, Volkswagen, I'm looking at you. Um, and then also uh, physical uh, controls on the steering wheel. That's a concept. You don't have to uh, touch anything on here. Including um, a uh, multifunction programmable key. Yeah, and, yes. yeah this button, which uh, we didn't program yet, so that can do something. It's like a hot favorite. It, yeah. Yeah, it's not, it doesn't do anything. Oh, it opens up. Oh, it takes up. you to the button yeah, settings, and then you so can you adjust can it customize there. it. Yeah, yeah, so lots of, the parking brake is here, which is interesting. Um, lots of power outlets. Lots of power yeah, outlets, outlets, yeah. USB-C in the seats, well, no, USB in, here, in the seats. Type A for data, Yep. Type C for power, another Type C for power, a 12 volt, an actual 12 volt. Type C in the seat, Type C in this seat, am I seeing that correctly? Yep, yep. anything here? No, but you have the 110. He has the 110 under Andrew's crotch, which we can't open because it requires the key to be inserted and unlocked, and we yeah. can't get the key out of the leather case. But anyways, it, it does exist. It's lit in blue. Um, yeah, this, as an interior as a whole, we're transitioning now to the more physical nature of the uh, interior here, um, makes a lot more sense than the Polestar did, right? This has a more Tesla 
esque in terms of thinking of okay, we have an EV, we can remove so many components, right? How do we open up the interior? And because this is designed from day one to be an EV, right? This feels more intentional as design in its open openness. Even though this doesn't slide, the center console, there's lots of space down here. Yeah. The center console is as deep as I don't want to reveal people's stuff in here, but this is super duper deep. I mean, let me my whole my whole forearm is actually in here. <laughs> Um, yeah, really, it's a great usage of space too. Like tons of room in the back as well. Oh, the back is um, extremely comfortable. Like I'm six foot one, and I'm sitting in a pretty comfortable position, and you can comfortably fit a human well, behind. Andrew's you. leg is not even touching your, your yeah. seat. You can go back like another another inch or two. Um, I can't remember if the Polestar had a flat. No, it didn't have it a flat. Had a gear mm. tunnel. Because it was designed for a gas engine, mm -hmm. right? Oh, so and, and the battery pack. I think they folded some of it up and down. Oh yes, yep. yes, it was yep. crazy. Yeah, this is this is, has that flat uh, you know floor design that Tesla's so famous for. So, um, you know the. The owner of this car has two booster seats in the back normally, and she reckons that she could actually fit a third seat in the middle too because it's so open back there. Oh, wow. And I and I believe here, or a normal human could sit in between the two booster seats. Sure. But the point is the back seat actually works. Um, and we filled it up with four people yesterday, right? And yeah. two of you were very tall and no one's knees were touching anyone's seats, right? So plenty of space in terms of the space, you know, the yeah, it's just, just such a great interior. Yes, let's talk about Fantastic charging. Segue. So so eGMP platform, yep. known for ultra-fast charging, mm -hmm. it's quoted uh, 20 to 80% in 18 minutes, yep. 350 kilowatt max. Yes. How did that work last night? Well, last night we pulled up to a uh, America, Electrified Apple America West. charger. We specifically went to the 350 kilowatt one, mm -hmm. which is called Ultra Charging. Ultra fast. Or is it hyper? Ultra. It has some name to it. Electrify America calls it ultra or hyper or something. One of them is 150, one of them is 350. It's not very clear. Yeah, yeah. It, the 150 one is called super fast, and I think the 350 is called ultra fast. I think this, I'm pretty sure the 350 it's, was ultra. It's very yeah. clear. It's as clear as uh, Audi's uh, naming scheme. Um, but um, with that, we plugged it in, and it, it actually started charging immediately, which, which, I, uh, which is a rare occurrence. And it's a little bit tricky. Once it started charging, it peaked at 320, 350-ish. It met those uh, peak uh, charging um, stats that I said that it would do, and I, after about two minutes, it dropped to about 120 kilowatts charging. Not slow, but that is not the 320, 350 that it's been quoted. Um, and then after about seven minutes, the charger aired, aired out. And this isn't just a one-time thing because right next to us was someone that had just bought a brand new Hyundai yep. Ionic 5, which is perfect. This guy, he, where, where did he buy from? Bur Beaverton or something? Uh, somewhere in, somewhere in he, Portland. He bought it in Oregon. He was literally on his way back from just purchasing the car and he met us. It was just such a, an amazing coincidence. And so we watched him uh, quick charge as well on the level three and he also aired out and he also plateaued at the 120 his car charged at exactly the same so it wasn't a car issue it was you know probably more than likely a charger issue um, but you know one of the things we've talked about before with charging speeds is, is one, it's kind of an obscure number right now. People don't really mm -hmm. know what that means. What is 150 versus 350? Is yeah. that fast? Is that slow? What is Tesla supercharger charging speeds at? Um, uh, and the other thing to keep in mind is a lot of the quoted speeds or the quoted EPA ranges, man, it's confusing. It's like it's, it, they're usually optimistic. They're usually peak numbers like we're talking about with these charge speeds. Sure. And I, um, the navigation, from my understanding, isn't fully optimized for um, Here I got you. For uh, uh, setting up these road trips either, I think. So if we go to nav. Yep, it's up. Oh, search. Is it going to load? And then let's say we go to, can I, can I just go to Spokane, like a generic location? Sure, Spokane Valley Mall, sure. So that's four and a bit hours away. I don't think it tells me where to stop on the way. Requesting connected routing. And that's something that Tesla does. Yeah, it doesn't. It just tells me how to get there. So it's up to me to separately find an app to plan the trip along here. Yeah, this is just this is just taking me to 279 miles. There you go. Whereas Tesla, you said destination, and it will tell you actively where to stop and does that thinking for you. Ford will as well now. They have a route planner as well. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. I think that's kind of a must on an EV. Absolutely, absolutely. That's, and, and that's my point. And once again, as much as I dislike Tesla, right, for all the various reasons we talked about, and that's not even talking about what's going on with Elon at the moment. Um, but it just, Tesla has really figured out how to make it really easy to own an EV and to really transition to EV, right? Because mm -hmm. all these are going to be things that will potentially turn off people. Um, and I think that might be a great segue to the next part is, should people buy this car? And we were all debating this question last night because we, we looked at it from a seller perspective, right? We looked at it from 
okay, as an EV, is it competitive? And I think and I think it is. It's priced yeah. reasonably well. You know, yes, it's a little bit more expensive than an equivalent Model Y, but it's a lot more comfortable than a Model Y, and it's built a lot better than a Model Y, and it just not, doesn't drive quite as sharp as the Model Y, but. But you know, there's a higher trim level that will maybe do that, and more importantly, it's built a lot better than the Model Y. And just um, the look of the interior yep, too, like yep. not, uh, you know, it, it just you're getting a lot more style and substance an for. An yeah. No, can't say that I am. <laughs> um, but with that, we also have to think about it from this perspective, right? Um, in a Cars and Fuel episode that Andrew and I did just weeks ago, we talked about how the rising prices of uh, new cars have climbed a lot, right? What, what was it? It's forty-eight thousand $48, $48, dollars. Average price of a new car right now, right? In my mind, that is a very nice high-end luxury car. Mm -hmm. I might just be poor. I don't know, um, but <laughs> but that is a lot of money. It's not something to scoff at. And this car with options is fifty-six thousand dollars. This is a nearly sixty thousand dollar Kia. Kia, right? And I did some research and the BMW X4 with similar features is about the same price. Yes, it's not an electric vehicle, all right? It's not as quick, all right? Just relax, hands away from the keyboard. But for almost $60,000, you could also have a BMW, which some people are going to have a hard time transitioning in their head where they think, okay, for the same price, I can have a BMW, which I've, I used to, I'm used to owning. I can have a gas vehicle that I don't have to worry about, you know, trying to find a gas station, right? When I'm, you know, out on a road trip, it has similar amount of room. Yes, the EV6 is a little bit better packaging, so it has a little bit more room. Um, the, I mean, the question becomes at, at fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000, are the sacrifices that you're making for an EV going to be worth it? You know, um, and, and that's kind of the tough thing about the EV market right now is I feel like a lot of the good EVs that are going to really um, change people's minds about EV ownership, right? We're talking a Ford Mach-E, we're mm -hmm. talking about, you know, EV6, Ionic 5, um, Tesla's even, they're kind of in the fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollar mile uh, or seventy thousand dollar range. Um, when are twenty five thousand dollar EVs going to be abound and plentiful, right? When are the Nissan Leafs of the world going to offer the same levels of range um, for me? Um, because there's a big difference between those two price points, right? At twenty five thousand dollars, I can afford to buy that as my commuter car, and I don't care that it's not like a Tesla where it, where it can't do the road trip stuff, right? At twenty five thousand dollars, that is the car that I only use to commute to today, and the money that I save actually allows me to buy that road trip car that's gasoline powered. To be honest, I'd be quite pleased if we could get to a point where the average EV is selling at what Elon's and Tesla's original goal for the three was. Was it thirty? If we could get to thirty-five thousand yeah. dollars, then the. Uh, lack of maintenance, uh, the lack of fuel costs, assuming you're charging at home, because I don't mm -hmm. think we touched on how much it costs to charge, no, charge no, we have uh, the Electrify America yep. versus like charging at home. Yep. Um, but if we can get to 35, then I feel like even at that price point, yeah. yes, it's a little more upfront, but it, sure. it, it offsets a lot of that. Yep, yep. Now, at, again, at 55, 60, you gotta be driving a lot to mm -hmm. to make up that money back in, um, in gas savings, right? Yeah. Um, and again, at $60,000, that's not really my commuter car. That might have to be my only car slash my main car. So overall, is the EV6 a good buy? You know, I think it's pretty competitive with most electric vehicles. Some might say the price is pretty high, you know, given the size of the vehicle, but more importantly, given the brand of the vehicle. Some people might be hesitant to pay this much for a Kia. But you gotta remember, it is an electric vehicle after all, and they're not cheap right now. The prices of electric vehicles haven't come down far enough to be a insane mass market vehicle. This is not a $35,000 car. This is not even a $45,000 car. This is almost $56,000. And at that price, it's pretty on par with other EVs, especially other EVs in the class. It has good range, uh, good performance, and the comfort level is incredible on the car. Now, what does this mean for Kia? I think this is gonna keep Kia in the game. Kia has been doing a great job of increasing their quality of their vehicles, and now they're being competitive by offering an electric vehicle as well, an electric vehicle that's built on its own platform. So that's good to see. We have high hopes for this car. Is it a successor for the Stinger? I think if you ask an existing Stinger owner, they would probably disagree, but that may change once we test the EV6 GT. But for now, EV6, pretty good buy.